Okay, uh, we're going to continue on here, chapter seven in the rain. <laughs> So uh, last time in chapter seven, uh, we talked about equations. Uh, we talked about how to write equations, balance equations. Remember that when we do balance equations, uh, we want to make sure that all of our coefficients here are always whole numbers. So as we talked about last time, uh, you definitely can use a fraction to balance the equation, uh, but you do need to clear it at the end. And you do need to, as we also talked about, end up with all of the uh, simplest whole numbers possible. So again, if you can go through and uh, reduce down all the coefficients by a common number and you do end up with all whole numbers, you should do that to have the properly balanced equation. Uh, we also talked about types of reactions as well. And in terms of types of reactions, there's really kind of two big categories of reactions that we talked about which are redox reactions and really double displacement reactions. And under the redox sort of category, we have things like our synthesis reaction. Uh, we have things like our decomposition reaction. We have our single replacement reaction. And we have our combustion reaction. And really, as we talked about with uh, redox here, it does involve one of the three reasons why a reaction will basically occur, which is a transfer of electrons. Uh, so somewhere along the way, there's some electrons being transferred from one party to the next. Uh, the double displacement, which has a general sort of definition that looks like this, where you have two ionic compounds coming together where the positive guys will switch partners and again form two new ionic compounds on the other side of the equation. And the result of this is two sort of specific sort of classification of reactions. Uh, one is sometimes referred to as a precipitation reaction. And that is when really one of these products here makes a solid, which is Again, oftentimes referred to as a precipitate, abbreviated as a PPT. Uh, and that's really the kind of second reason why a reaction would take place is the formation of some type of solid. The other type of double displacement, which is commonly seen, is an acid-base reaction. And when you have an acid-base neutralization reaction, uh, you basically make two things as a result of that. You make what's referred to as a salt, which is an ionic compound and you make water. And again, is that formation of water, which is sort of the third reason why a reaction takes place. And really the water is coming from both parties. Uh, the acid will pretty much donate the H plus and the base will pretty much donate the OH minus. And it's these two guys coming together to make that water on the other side. And that ultimately is, uh, especially with a reaction of a strong acid and strong base, pretty much the main reaction that's taking place is you're basically making water. And that's why a reaction of a strong acid and strong base together is sometimes called that acid base neutralization because essentially water is pretty much the product that's being made in that case. Any questions on any of that stuff we talked about last time? <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about some important sort of calculations. Uh, along the way here, including molar mass and Avogadro's number. And molar mass, as we will talk about, has units of grams per mole. Avogadro's number is obviously a number that is used. And really, you could think of these two things, as we'll talk about along the way here, as really nothing more than sort of a conversion factor. And there are two things that allows us to do certain types of conversions in chemistry, um, go from grams to moles, or maybe go to atoms and stuff like that. So we'll talk about these guys now. Let's talk about first the mole. Uh, so the mole is a name in chemistry that uh, basically represents a certain amount of something. So in life, we have a lot of words that represent like numbers. We have a pair of something that represents we have two. If we got a dozen, it represents you got 12. Got a gross of pencils. I think that's where these use that a lot of. I got 144 of them. 
So in chemistry, we have a word that represents a certain number of things. And that word is the mole, not the furry guy, but uh, that is the mole. And by the way, that is the abbreviation for the mole, which is M-O-L. They had to cut something off. So I guess they cut the E off there to make it an abbreviation. And I mentioned that because a lot of people screw up with this by when they see that, uh, they kind of automatically jump to molecules when they see that M-O-L. And again, it is not molecules. It is the abbreviation for moles. So keep that in mind. In chemistry, if they want molecules, uh, they'll write out molecules, the whole word. Uh, so if you do see that M-O-L, it's not an abbreviation for anything other than a mole. And again, that's a very common mistake that people make. So a mole is really the amount of elementary substances like atoms or molecules, as there is in the carbon-12 isotope, which was the standard that they used for the atomic mass. So much like a pair, a dozen, a gross, one mole of anything uh, will equal 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And this is what is known as Avogadro's number. Now it's the unit part here of Avogadro's number, which is a little bit different. And what I mean by that is, frankly, it could be any kind of unit you want to put on that number. Uh, a lot of times we deal with atoms. Could be molecules. Could be particles. Could be uh, shoes, could be pizzas, whatever it may be. Although the occasional shoe and pizza question comes about. But uh, most of the time, probably here, we will be using atoms and molecules as our sort of units for that. So uh, again, like you say, you have a pair, it means two. If you say you have a mole, it means you have that many atoms or molecules, basically, of whatever you're talking about uh, in chemistry. This a number, as I mentioned before, We'll come back to those pictures, I think, is what's referred to as Avogadro's number. And the number that we do use here is the 6.022 times 10 to the 23. Avogadro's number is really the conversion factor that we use to go from these units here of moles to uh, atoms or molecules and backwards. So for example, if I had one mole of hydrogen, that would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen. And that's really something that we could use as a conversion factor. So like normal conversion factors, you could write two of them. You could write one mole of hydrogen over 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Or you could flip it around. I'll go on the other side here. You could go 6.022 up on top. Atoms over one mole. So like a normal sort of conversion factor, you'll just pick one of them to use if you need to use them. You obviously would not use them both. Otherwise, you would undo your calculation along the way. You could do that relationship with really anybody on the periodic table. Uh, so if I had one mole of carbon, it would contain 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon, any element that you do there. You could also relate Avogadro's number to things that are not just elements by themselves. So if you had one mole of water, it would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water and again here water is a molecule so we don't use atoms as a unit we use molecules as a unit but it represents the same amount and again you can write two conversion factors one mole of water over 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules or you can flip it around put Avogadro's number up on top 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules over one mole of water. And also just like any of the elements, you could basically do that relationship with any molecule. Uh, you know, if I had one mole of methane, CH4, it would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of methane. So uh, 
it's the same idea, for example, if you had a dozen donuts, that means you got 12 donuts, right? But if you had a dozen pencils, you got 12 pencils, right? So again, the units that go with that number of 12 can change. And so the units here of Avogadro's number basically can change as well. The problem that people have a lot with Avogadro's number is they go like, I learned this number. Let me just put it in every calculation I ever do. And you should not do that. So the key here is you should only use Avogadro's number if you have a number that's given to you in atoms or molecules or particles or something like that. Or you're asked to solve for something that's in atoms, molecules, or something like that. If you don't see any mention of atoms, molecules, you should leave Avogadro's number on the side and not use it. And again, that's also a very common problem people have. Just like throw that in, you know, in every calculation where it shouldn't be along the way. Any questions on that? <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, that uh, term mole represents Avogadro's number. And again, you can apply it to atoms, you can apply it to molecules. The other sort of conversion factor, which is probably something that we use, believe it or not, more than Avogadro's number, is molar mass. And molar mass, as I mentioned before, has two units, and they stay together, which are grams per mole. And you typically will get a number, and the number always stays with the grams part, and it's always per one mole. The molar mass is the mass in grams per mole of a substance. And frankly, where we find the molar mass is on the periodic table. So if you look at the periodic table, we see the number on the bottom. And earlier we talked, I think maybe about the number on the bottom and that is the atomic mass in AMU per atom. It is numerically equal to the molar mass in grams per mole. So we use the same number on the bottom and that's referred to as the molar mass. And that's a more usable unit for us because as you know from being in the lab, when you go to the balance or the scale, it doesn't tell you how many AMU it is in terms of the mass, right? It tells you how many grams it is, right? So that unit of grams is a much more useful sort of unit uh, for us to use. We still do the same thing when you pull that number off the periodic table on the bottom there Four significant figures is basically how much you use of it. And molar mass is a really important conversion used probably more than anything. Uh, and it is the conversion that we use to go from grams to moles and moles back to grams. So that is the molar mass is basically our conversion factor to do that. We get that from the periodic table. So for example, if we looked at our hydrogen there, we would see it says 1.008. What that means is in hydrogen, there's 1.008 grams of hydrogen for every mole of hydrogen. And that would give us a molar mass of hydrogen of 1.008 grams per mole. We could also, again, use that really as a conversion factor. We could say that there are 1.008 grams per mole of hydrogen, or again, we could flip it around and do a mole of hydrogen is 1.008 grams. So we use this as a conversion factor. Again, instead of looking up in a, a sort of book table, we look up in the periodic table and we can get the molar mass to use as a conversion factor. Just like uh, we could do with Avogadro's number, we could also do molar masses for things that are not just one element, but are something like a molecule or a compound. So we could take something like water and we can go to the periodic table and calculate the molar mass of water by frankly just adding up all the parts. So there are two hydrogens, each are 1.008 grams per mole on the periodic table, basically our hydrogens. And we would add it to our one oxygen, which on the periodic table is 16 grams per mole. That's our oxygen. And we would add that together and that would get us something like 18.02 grams per mole. And once again, we could use that as a conversion factor to go from grams to moles or moles to grams, writing it like a normal conversion factor, 18.02 grams per mole of water or a mole of water 
is 18.02 grams. So if you need to calculate the molar mass to do a calculation, you basically do it based on the formula and you add it all together. One thing that people also sort of screw up on is later on when we use molar mass and calculations, for example, we talked about balancing equations. So let's just say, for example, here, we had an equation that was balanced and it had like a four in front of the water and you needed to do a calculation uh, that needed the molar mass of water. The molar mass of water in this case would be still 18.02. So whenever you calculate the molar mass of something, you should only do it based off of the actual formula by itself, one of the formulas, because that's really what this bottom part means. It is 18.02 grams in one mole of, say, water, and one mole of water would be just H2O. Even though there's a four in the equation, you never, ever include that in the molar mass calculation. So whenever you do molar mass, should only do it based off of just the formula by itself. Later on, as we'll talk about, you will take that four into account, but you never use it uh, when you're doing molar mass. So always just from the formula, add up all the parts for one formula, regardless if they may have a coefficient in the balance equation, if you need molar mass. Now, a lot of times you will come across problems where uh, you will need molar mass, but it will not tell you to calculate the molar mass. You just need to know that I have grams, I wanna get the moles, or I have moles, I wanna get the grams, I need the molar mass. So that's what you have to sort of remember is sort of a conversion factor that's sort of always available to you because you probably always have access to a periodic table. So it's something that you could always use, but very commonly in later chapters, they're just not gonna tell you, hey, you need to calculate the molar mass here. They just expect you to know that you have grams, you need to get the moles or vice versa, that that's gonna be your conversion factor to do so. Just like with Avogadro's number, if you needed to use Avogadro's number, they're not gonna blinking lights and problems tell you to use Avogadro's number. They're gonna expect you to know that when you see something about atoms or molecules, that should trigger in your head. I should probably use Avogadro's number. Again, it's another sort of conversion that's just available to you to use. So outside of a straight calculate the molar mass type problem and application of it, they usually obviously don't tell you that you need to calculate it. It's just, again, something that you need to know. Question on that there. <clears throat> So how do all these things sort of relate to each other? Well, they relate to each other by, if I have say grams and I have atoms, or if I have molecules, the one sort of unit between these two are moles. Yeah, so that's sort of the unit that ties both of these things together. And again, as we go from grams to moles or moles to grams, that's gonna be your molar mass conversion from the periodic table, which are grams per mole. As you go from moles to atoms or molecules or back, that's going to be your Avogadro's number. So again, that mole is sort of the unit that ties them both together. If he has to kind of go from one end to the next uh, to do so, and that's sort of your pathway. So how that works is obviously like for hydrogen, 1.008 grams of hydrogen equals one mole of hydrogen, which equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen. 18.02 grams of water equals one mole of water. And that equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water. So again, that is how they're all related to each other. And a lot of times, like I said before, you may not use Avogadro's number a lot of times in calculations. So again, don't necessarily have to use it always. So for example, if I wanted to calculate the uh, molar mass of C2H6O, why don't you calculate that? And I'll give you some periodic table stuff, carbon 12.01. Hydrogen 1.008 and oxygen 16. Okay, so let's take a look. So once again, if you need the molar mass, uh, this is where you should head to the periodic table 
And again, it's those numbers underneath the symbol, which in this application represents how many grams there are per mole. And in a case of something like this, a compound or something of this nature, you're just gonna pretty much just add up all the parts. So in this case, we do have two carbons. Uh, so carbon would be two times 12.01 from the periodic table. Uh, we have six hydrogens, so six times 1.008 grams per mole, which represents our hydrogens. And we have just one oxygen here, which we would add up. So once again, this is sort of our carbon contribution, our hydrogen contribution, and this would be our oxygen contribution. Again, all found from the periodic table and the number underneath. We add all that together, that's going to be two times 12.01. Uh, plus six times 1.008 uh, plus the 16. That's going to give us 4607. Again, the units are grams per mole. The number always stays with the grams part, and it's always one mole. And again, uh, that's basically the units of molar mass. That would, again, be something that we could use as a conversion factor if we needed to. So if we had grams of ethanol here, and we wanted the moles, we could use that. Or if we had moles and wanted grams, we could also use it. So for example, if we had 42.5 grams of this guy and we wanted to know how many moles, we would use our molar mass once again as a conversion factor to do so. We would take 42.5 grams of it. We wanna set it up with dimensional analysis because that means we're gonna go opposite which means the grams part needs to go on the bottom, right? To cancel out. And that would give us 46.07 grams per mole of C2H6O. Grams would cancel 42.5 divided by 46.07. Going to get us 0 0.923 moles here of C2H6O. And so once again, we're going to use molar mass really as a conversion factor. And again, we get it from the periodic table. Question on that. By the way, that is probably how most of the time you will use molar mass in a problem like that. Like you got grams, you need to go to moles. Didn't mention anything about calculating molar mass or anything like that. Again, you have to recognize, I got to go from grams to moles. I need the molar mass. So again, they will not tell you in problems to calculate it or anything like that question on up there <clears throat> so if we go back to sort of this picture i think I skipped up earlier somewhere there's a picture maybe there it is these are all one mole uh samples of things of sulfur iron sodium chloride why are they all not the same amount if they are technically the same amount of one mole why do they all look like they're different amounts in there yeah, so one mole of sulfur, for example, right, represents 3207 grams, right? One mole of iron is 55.85 grams. One mole of sodium chloride is, you know, roughly, I don't know, what is that, like 58, 44 or something in that ballpark? So although they all do represent one mole of each of these things, uh, the actual sort of gram relationship, right, represents a sort of different amount of grams for each of those things. So although they are all one mole, that's why they all kind of look different because they do represent a different amount of grams. Question on that. <clears throat> all right. So Avogadro's number and molar mass, again, are those conversion factors that you just got to remember you have in certain situations to do these type of calculations. So let us do some of these calculations here, perhaps, and see what we got going on. So why don't you try both of these here? I'll give you some information in case you can't see the periodic table behind me. 4.003 for uh, helium. What we got there? Zinc. They changed zinc. 6538. Uh, used to be 6539, but we'll go with 38. There we go. All right. So for each of them, see what you come up with here. Let's take a look. So we'll start with the first one. How many moles of helium are there in 5.46 grams of helium? So the first question is, do I need to use Avogadro's number here? 
I do not. Again, there's no mention of atoms, molecules, so just leave Avogadro's number on the side. This is going from grams to moles. And again, as I mentioned a second ago, that's got to be the key thing in your head that says, I need molar mass, right? To do that, that is the conversion thing that I need to go from that. That means I should head over to the periodic table, right, to do that. In this case, uh, we just need helium. And that means that there are basically 4.003 grams per mole is the molar mass of helium. That really does give us, again, those two conversion factors that you can use, 4.003 grams over one mole. Or again, you can flip it the other way, put a mole up on top and 4.003 grams on the bottom. Uh, so again, you want to think of that as a conversion factor, and that is the best way to do it and set it up dimensional analysis so you can see the units, you know, where they need to be. So with that being said, remember that when we do kind of set it up with dimensional analysis here, we just got to think opposite. So we would want to use it in this form here where the grams are on the bottom. And that also helps us take care of the proper math that we need to do because we know that we should be dividing by what's there on the bottom. And that will get us to the right answer, hopefully. And that would be 5.46 divided by 4.003. And again, here the grams would cancel 1.36 moles of helium. Any question on that calculation there? <clears throat> Bottom one, we're looking for grams of zinc and uh, 0.256 moles of zinc. Avogadro's number on that one. Now, again, remember that the MOL is the mole abbreviation, not molecules. So that is a mole. So in this case, we're just going backwards, right? That is our mole to gram conversion. And that is still the molar mass there from the periodic table. So that is where we're going to get here. That basically will give us 65.38 grams per mole that we could use as a conversion factor like we did sort of up on top. We'll take our 0 0.256 moles of zinc. Once again, in this case though, we do want the moles on the bottom. So moles are gonna go on the bottom, so they cancel. 6538 grams is gonna go up on top. And in this case here, 0 0.256 times 6538 gets me a 16.7 grams of zinc. Three sig figs really based off of the original number and also same thing here based off of that number as well. Uh, question on either of those calculations. These are probably two of the most common chemistry calculations that you do in relationship to lots of other calculations that you're doing. A lot of the first steps that you do in a number of calculations is take the grams and convert them to moles. So that's a very common sort of just byproduct calculation of another calculation that she has to do. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, let's try our friend here, Gold. Hey, you. Uh, that is a buck 97 on the periodic table, I think. All right. We're looking for the mass in grams of one gold atom in this case. Okay, let's take a look at it. So uh, we're looking for the mass in grams of one gold atom. Do I need Avogadro's number in this one? I do, and that's the key word right there, right? So again, as soon as you kind of see that, probably somewhere along the way, Avogadro's number should probably come into play. In this case, we actually want to go from grams all the way to atoms, or actually the opposite way. Uh, but uh, what ties, again, those two sort of units together is the other unit of moles. So that is, again, sort of the one that ties them together. In this case, we would have to roll in this direction towards moles. So that's atoms to moles, which is where we would use Avogadro's number to do so. Once we have it in moles, we could go the rest of the journey there by using the molar mass from the periodic table. So again, that's sort of the pathway to get us where we need to. That also means right in one mole of gold, there should be 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of gold, which obviously gives us our two conversion factors that we could use uh, to go with that first step. So let's do that first step. We will have one gold atom. Once again, we're gonna go opposite using our Avogadro's number here. So we want atoms on the bottom, which means Avogadro's number should go on the bottom here of 
two two times ten to twenty three. I'll just write atoms underneath. Is one mole of gold. At this point, the atoms would cancel, and I would be at units of moles at this point, which again is close to where I want. It got me right here halfway there. So now I need to go to the periodic table, which is where I find my molar mass conversion factor. And again, that 197 means that there is a 197 grams per mole is the molar mass there of gold. And again, we're just gonna use that as a conversion factor. Also, again, why it's important to set it up like this, because we can now clearly see that the moles need to go on the bottom, right, opposite, and grams should end up on top. Uh, so when we do that, remember that the number always stays with the grams part in molar mass. So that is always where the number actually stays. And now if I do that, I am in units of grams, which is what I'm looking for. We're basically gonna multiply across the top, which is basically 197. And we're gonna divide it by on the bottom, which is basically our Avogadro's number. We wanna again, make sure we use our exponent button. We right? put in Avogadro's number into our calculator. And if you do all that, that's a 3.271 times 10 to the minus 22 grams of gold in this case. That is a large number, small number. It's a really small number, right? It's like 21 places that way and throw some zeros in front. And that is the mass there of one gold atom in this case. You could obviously have got a number after the first conversion. Again, I went around too much uh, till the end there, but um, if you're wondering about the significant figures here, since one gold atom would kind of be like something you would count, it would probably be considered more of an exact number. So I went to uh, four significant figures based off the molar mass, uh, but really you probably could have went to as many significant figures as you chose on this particular one. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> All right, let's try a few more here maybe. Let me just make up some and try some, let's see. Let's say, uh, Let's say we had um, 32.6 grams of C3H8. And we want to know uh, how many moles that is. And we'll also go with how many molecules that is as well. And uh, carbon is 12.01 and hydrogen is 1.008. All right, so give that a go, see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look, see how you're doing. Uh, so in this case, uh, we do want to go from grams to moles, right? And then moles to molecules. So am I going to use Avogadro's number in this case? I am I'm going to use it on the back end of this calculation, right? Going from moles to molecules. So that is where we're going to use Avogadro's number. But before we could do that, right, we need to get it into moles, right? So we need to go from grams to moles, which again is the molar mass conversion that we're going to get from the periodic table. So again, that's going to be our molar mass from the periodic table uh, where we're going to grab that from. So we're going to start with the grams to moles part of the calculation. So once again here, we're just going to add up all the parts from the periodic table that's in this formula. And in this case, uh, we have three carbons. So three times the 12.01 grams per mole for our carbons. Plus we have eight hydrogens, each at 1.008 grams per mole from the periodic table. Uh, so if we do all that good stuff there, that's going to be three times 12.01 uh, plus eight times 1.008. Looks like a 4409. Again, usually four significant figures is where you kind of want to round your molar mass to and also take off the periodic table in terms of the numbers. Any question on that so far? Once again, that is going to be our conversion factor, right, that we're going to use. So we're going to set it up with uh, 32.6 grams of C3H8. Once again here, uh, if you wanted to write out your conversion factors, this is basically what it will look like are the opposite. 
And now we really don't have to think about, should I divide, should I multiply? We just need to think opposites. So again, here, grams are on top. So opposite would put grams on the bottom and that will get us our 4409 grams uh, per mole here of our C3H8. I am actually gonna get an answer in this case because it's one of the questions we're trying to answer, right? Which is how many moles we have. And again, a reminder, in case I didn't say it, these are two different things, right? Again, the first one is moles. The second one is molecules, right? So we're going to take uh, 32.6. We're going to divide it by 4409. And that will give us for our first answer 0.739 moles of C3H8. Here again, going to three significant figures really based off of the first number there uh, that has three significant figures. Any questions up to that point? All right, obviously if we were going all the way to the end and didn't really care about the middle number, we could just do it all in one calculation and we wouldn't necessarily have to get an answer here. Uh, but we're gonna just continue on at this point. Uh, now that we have it in moles, we could now use Avogadro's number here as really our conversion factor to get to the end here. And that would mean right one mole of anything, including C3H8. Uh, would equal 6.022 times 10 to 23. The units here again will now be molecules as this is a molecule, right? Uh, so those are the units we're going to use. So I'm going to uh, continue on with that number. And to be truthfully honest with you, I'm going to still use uh, the entire number that's in my calculator. So I'm not gonna use the rounded number. I'm just gonna use the entire number that I got from the first part of the calculation. And we're going to go opposites here, which means the moles need to end up on the bottom. And in this case, Avogadro's number needs to end up up on top. And that will put our molecules in the correct spot of what we're looking for. Moles will cancel. And again, I'm gonna continue on with the whole number. And then I'm gonna hit 6.022, my exponent button and 23. No extra buttons when you hit it, yes. Will be 4.45 times 10 to 23. And again, this case would be molecules here of C3H8. Any questions on that part of the calculation there? So again, hopefully you could kind of see that you want to think of these as conversion factors. And like I said before, in most problems you come across where you need to use these things, they're not going to say with flashing lights, hey, you need to use this. These are just things you got to know that that's how you go from this unit to the next unit. Any questions? All right, we're going to uh, continue on here. Before it's the weekend, before it rains more. I don't know. I walked out of my classes during this morning. I'm like, Where, where's all this rain? I'm like, what's that happened there? I went in way early in the morning and it was like dry. And I come out, I'm like, all oh, this water, not good. All right. So uh, <laughs> people don't know how to drive with water for some reason. Like the freeway is backed up for miles. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> all right. Enough of my complaints. We'll continue on now. Um, any questions so far and stuff we've been talking about here? Really important uh, conversion. Again, the molar mass, probably more than Avogadro's number. You shouldn't obviously know how to do Avogadro's number, but you will definitely use the molar mass sort of conversion a lot more than you'll use probably anything else uh, in chemistry. So uh, before we kind of move off of this sort of topic, I do want to talk about another sort of version of this calculation that you do sometimes come across. So I'm gonna um, do that as soon as I find where I ever put my writing thing. There it is. All right, so let's say we had something like uh, 75.5, uh, no, let's, uh, let's do grams of uh, C2H6O. And we wanted to know uh, how many Hydrogen atoms does it contain? So we got a, a couple of things going on, on on this particular problem. First off, do you think we will need to use Avogadro's number somewhere? We will, right? Again, the keyword there is atoms, right? We also have a little bit of a different thing that we're trying to get to at the end. 
Uh, we're not really interested in this entire thing, right? We're just interested in the hydrogen part of it. So we sometimes we will have questions where uh, they may ask you about maybe one of the elements that are in the formula or something like that, not the entire thing altogether. So we need a way to be able to kind of go from the whole thing to just the element that we're kind of interested in. And one way that you could do that is actually use the formula itself as a conversion factor to go from the entire thing to just whatever element you're interested in. And the way that we can do that is we actually use the little subscripts on the bottom, which a reminder, right, goes to the people here to the left, or the elements to the left. And those numbers on the bottom can represent the moles of each of those elements that are present. So from this one particular formula, for example, we actually could come up with three different sort of relationships uh, between the whole thing and each of the elements. So for example, I could say in one mole of the entire thing, that would give me two moles of carbon. And once again, the two comes from right there. That gives me basically that relationship. I could also say in one mole of the entire thing, how many moles of hydrogen would I have? It would be six, which would be that little guy there on the bottom. And that would be six moles of hydrogen. And in case we were interested in oxygen, we could do the same type of relationship and we would have how many moles of oxygen? One mole of oxygen. So this is a way that we can go from the, good? We, this way we could go from the whole thing uh, to each of the individual elements, kind of use like a mole to mole relationship and using the formula as a conversion factor uh, to do so. Now, in order to use those relationships, and by the way, each of those relationships, you could write two conversion factors for, for example, the first one, you could say one mole of C2H6O over two moles of carbon are two moles of carbon, one mole of C2H6O. I won't write them all for the rest of them, but you could basically write two conversion factors you know, for any of those equalities, because that's basically what that is. It's basically an equality, just like any type of conversion factor sort of equality. So in this particular case, in order to use them, because they are sort of a mole to mole relationship, uh, we do need to get our grams here into moles. And we know how to do that, obviously, as we've been talking about. We first got to take it from grams of the entire thing to moles of the entire thing. And that, again, is our molar mass that we would need. Now, I think we calculated this earlier today, I think. So I want to go with 4607. But once again, we would do our 2 times our 12.01 plus our six times our 1.008. And here we do need to do the molar mass of the entire thing, uh, because frankly, that is what we're starting with, right? Is the entire thing. So that's what we have to get uh, into moles. So I believe that should still be 4607 unless it's changed. Let's see. Uh, Forty six oh seven. I like it. So that is uh, 46.07 grams per mole. Once again, that is the molar mass of the entire thing taken from the periodic table. So that'll be the first part really of our calculation here. We're going to go with uh, 75.5 grams of C2H6O. Once again, here we want to get rid of the grams. So we're going to put the grams on the bottom. And again, the number always stays with the grams part. Again, here, right at this point, the grams, right, will cancel. And I'm now in moles of the entire thing, which is kind of where I want to be. Any questions on that so far? Now that I have moles of the entire thing, I can now tell from the entire thing to just hydrogen, which is really what I'm interested in here. So we would use the middle relationship here that we got from the formula, which would be this one, right? That is the whole thing to moles of hydrogen here. And if you want to get an answer at this point, you can, or since it's really not where we're going to finish up, I'm just going to kind of continue on with the calculation. I want to get rid of moles of the entire thing, which means I do need to put that on the bottom using the highlighted relationship there. And up on top would be six moles of hydrogen. 
At this point, the moles of the entire thing are now gone. And I am now successfully transferred it to units of just the hydrogen, right? Which is what I'm interested in this case. So that is again, coming from the actual formula itself, using it as a conversion factor to do so. Any questions up to there? Am I done with my calculation, by the way? I am not, I'm in moles, I need to get to, so this is where our friend Avogadro is gonna come into play, right? So we're going to use Avogadro's number here to go from moles to atoms in this case. And this is the same sort of Avogadro's relationship, right? In this case, one mole of hydrogen would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen. And that is what we're going to use here on the back end of our calculation as our last conversion. We want the moles to cancel. So moles will go on the bottom and our Avogadro's number there will go up on top. And those will be our atoms and our moles of hydrogen will cancel. At this point, we have now successively got it to atoms and it's just a dimensional analysis set up, which means math wise, you don't have to worry because you know everything on top gets multiplied, right? And everything on the bottom gets divided. Again, the beauty of setting it up this way is it takes the thinking about what I should do mathematically out of it, if you just remember, right? Multiply it on top, divide on the bottom, and you'll have the right math done for you. So let's do that. That's 75.5 times 6. Try that again, times six, there we go, times uh, 6.022 exponent button 23. Remember, as we talked about when we were doing conversions at the end of the top, hit equals, divided by the bottom number there, which is 46, kind of like five, but 4607. And that's gonna get us here, uh, 5.92 times 10 to the 24 atoms of hydrogen that is a small number or large number yeah there's a lot of hydrogen atoms and 75.5 grams of ethanol there's a lot of them floating around in that particular solution question on that calculation there so again it's, it's sometimes common that you will come across a question where they're again not interested in the whole thing but really just one part of it Any questions on that all right i tried one why don't you try one let's see let's do uh Let's say we had, let's say we had, I'm just going to make up a number because that always works well. Let's try it. Let's go with that 7.23 times 10 to the, I don't know, let's go with 24. Why not? Molecules of, I don't know, let's go with, let's make up some letters here, C4H10O2, why not? How many grams of carbon are there? Make our carbon bigger. All right, how many grams of carbon are in this many molecules of this guy? Again, some numbers from the periodic table it might be helpful along your journey, maybe, or not. I don't know. We'll see. And once again, I'll do it as well because I made it up, so I'll hope for the best. All right. So we have molecules of whatever I just made up there. It probably doesn't exist. Uh, how many grams of carbon are there? Uh, so a couple of things to jump out at you. We see molecules, which means somewhere along our journey, Avogadro's number is going to be needed, right, to get us to moles. And that is good because if we use Avogadro's number to go from molecules to moles, we then could go from moles of the whole thing to moles of just carbon in this case, right, using the actual equation. And at that point, we can actually go from moles of carbon to grams using the molar mass. So 
Uh, we can use the formula here to do that. So that's sort of our pathway to get to where we need to go. So why not start with uh, the relationship that we need, right? So we don't necessarily have to write all the relationships here since we're only interested in carbon. And from the actual equation, again, using these bottom numbers here as moles uh, means that in one mole of the entire thing here, uh, we will have four moles of carbon. And again, that's pretty much the only relationship that we need from that equation. Obviously, if we we're dealing with hydrogen, it would be 10 moles. And if we we're dealing with oxygen, it would be two. But why put extra things that we don't really need in this particular case? All right, so we know we need to get to moles. But in this case, it's not too bad of a journey because we can use Avogadro's number up front to go from molecules to moles of the entire thing. So that is where we should start. Uh, we know that in one mole of the entire thing, I put a no there. Uh, we will have 6.022 times 10 to 23 molecules, which is Avogadro's number. So we're going to use that as our first part of our conversion, 7.23 times 10 to the 24 molecules of the entire thing. We will use Avogadro's number where molecules will actually go on the bottom, in this case, opposite, so that they cancel out. That means Avogadro's number should go on the bottom here. And that would be moles of this entire thing. If I stop my calculation right at this point, right, the molecules will cancel. And now I have converted it into moles of the entire thing. And the purpose of why I want to do that is now that's going to allow me, right, to use my formula, which moved me to here. Now we could use my formula to move me to just carbon, right? So that is sort of the goal of what we're trying to do here. So again, I don't really need a, an answer at this point. So I'm just going to continue on with the calculation. And we want to get rid of moles of the entire thing. So we're going to go with one mole of the entire thing here will give us our four moles of carbon. And since I did run out of room there, I will get an answer at this point. Uh, you don't necessarily have to, but I'm just gonna throw an answer up here. So I don't have to write all that there. And times four divided by Avogadro's number. Want to make sure we're using our exponent buttons. So somewhere at this point, you got something like 48.023912 clearly not rounding at all at this point, I guess, moles of carbon. That's a lot of numbers. Uh, that is close to where I want, but I do need to go one more step, right? If I wanted moles, I could put a box on it, get rid of a lot of numbers there, uh, but put a box on it. But here I do need to go one more step. And that last step is going to be the molar mass, which means out of these three, you actually only needed carbon in this calculation. And that would mean that carbon's molar mass is 12.01 grams per mole. So we'll use that as our last part of the calculation. Here we want grams up on top so that the moles of carbon will cancel. And I'll use my whole number, which I wrote on the screen there. And we will end up now, I should definitely clean it up to how many significant figures? I'm going to go with three right about there. Yeah, so I'm going to go with three based off of the original number. And that's going to give me 577 grams of carbon in this particular case. Question on that one there. So again, any questions? Yeah. So uh, and this is a very common thing that sometimes you do come across. And using that formula as sort of a multiple -mole relationship is a good thing to know how to do. And actually will come in handy in just a second. We'll do similar type of things in just here in just a sec. Any questions on grams of moles, moles of grams, atoms, molecules, Avogadro's number. I need to be able to do all of those calculations. But I would say again, the one that will come up the most is that molar mass, grams of moles, moles of grams. It's used a lot of places throughout the rest of our chemistry journey here. All right, so let's talk about a place where we will use that conversion here. And let's talk about the next thing that we're going to do, which is kind of putting together two things that we've been talking about. We're going to put together balancing equations and equations and reactions and grams to moles. 
and we're going to use equations to figure out how much product, for example, we would produce if we started with a certain amount, or if we produced a certain amount of product, how much reactants we might have had to start with to do that. This is what is sometimes referred to as stoichiometry. So this is sometimes referred to as stoichiometry uh, of the equation. And let's talk about ways that we can interpret a balanced equation. And by the way, none of this will work out correctly in terms of calculations if your equation is not properly balanced. So that's, as we'll talk about shortly, pretty much the first step that you should always do. And as we talked about probably when we were talking about balancing equations, if you're given an equation or you write the equation, whatever it may be, you want to always double check that it's balanced because uh, we pretty much never ever use an unbalanced equation in the chemistry. It always has to be balanced. So you want to make sure you do that. When we do look at a balanced equation, we could look at those coefficients that we see in the balanced equation. And they do represent a couple of ways that we could look at this equation. We could say, for example, here that two molecules of H2 react with one molecule of O2 uh, to produce two molecules of H2O. The relationship that we use pretty much in stoichiometry and what we're going to talk about is what is sometimes referred to as the mole to mole relationship, which we could say for every two moles of H2, we have to throw in there one mole of O2 uh, to get out two moles of H2O. There is no trickery here. It is simply just the number in front of everybody in the balanced equation. That is where those numbers come from. It is, that's why balancing the equation is really important here uh, so that you get the right relationship when you kind of do the stoichiometry part of it. Last one is uh, something we won't really use in calculations, but it is uh, the idea that we talked about uh, conservation of mass. So as we talked about in a chemical reaction, the only thing that happens is we break bonds and make new bonds. So that's all electrons. So as we talked about, we never change elements from reactants to products. So if we started with four hydrogens here in this reaction, we will end with four hydrogens, which means hydrogen is 1.008 on the left. It's 1.008 on the right, which means you'll have the same mass of all those elements along the way because uh, we never lose any type of element. But this is really the big one for stoichiometry the mole to mole relationship, nothing more than the actual coefficients from the balanced equation. So what do we use stoichiometry problems to help us understand? It is sort of what I just mentioned. If we have an equation or reaction that we're looking at and we know how much we're starting with, or again, even how much we produced, uh, we can basically figure out everything about that reaction of how much reactants we should have had, how much products we should have made. We could do some calculations from the equation uh, to figure those things out. So the units uh, that we could use in stoichiometry problem are pretty much any units, but the good news for you guys is it's pretty much just grams and moles all the way in this class. We don't do any liters or pressures or anything like that. So that's pretty good. Uh, so pretty much it's our grams to moles, moles to grams, which as we've been talking about all day long, how do I go between those? That is the, yeah, that's the molar mass. And I find that on the periodic table. Yeah. So that is super used a lot in these calculations. It's pretty much after the balance equation, pretty much the first thing that you do is that sort of conversion of grams to moles. This is the mole method, uh, which again, we get from the equation. And it really is, uh, when you think about sort of uh, the moles of each of these things are the coefficient, it's really like a proportion of what you need of each of those guys to produce a certain amount of product. It's kind of like when you bake, right? You need so much flour, so much chocolate chips, right? Butter and all that to get yourself 12 cookies or 24 cookies or however many cookies that you're baking. You need the right proportion of everything to produce that many cookies. And that's really what the stoichiometry is when we look at it like that. It's basically the right proportion of these reactants, for example, to produce a certain amount of products at the end of it. And when we do stoichiometry problem, there's really four basic steps. There's a few extra, a couple extra ones up here, uh, which could happen. So step number one would be a situation where you're not given the actual chemical equation or reaction. 
you're just given everything in words. And obviously, if you're given things in words, as we talked about uh, when we were balancing equations earlier on in this chapter, the very first thing that you want to make sure you do is get all the proper formulas down first without worrying about the balancing part, right? So if you have reactants and you need to get products, you need to write the proper formulas for the product side first and get everything down correctly in terms of their formulas. Then you should do the next thing, which is balance the equation. So remember, you don't want to do those things at the same time because you'll end up with probably the wrong formulas. Things will not balance. The really first thing that you should always do is balance the equation then you want to take whatever they give you and get them to grams so that you could go from grams to moles, basically. Then you're going to do the big stoichiometry part, which is the mole to mole relationship from the equation. And then you will convert those moles to some other units. So I would say probably 99 times out of 100, you can boil all these steps down to these four basic steps that you should always follow when you're doing these type of problems. Balance your equation. Convert your grams to moles, obviously using our molar mass as we just talked about. Go to the balanced equation and find the mole to mole relationship. And we'll talk about what we're looking for in a second. And lastly, if you did all three of those steps correctly, the units you should be currently in are moles, which may be what you want. So you could put a box on the answer at that point. But a lot of times you may be interested in grams at the end, which means you might have to use molar mass on the back end of this calculation. So you want to convert those moles into some other units. Pretty much all the stoichiometry problems that we do in this class will pretty much boil down to those four steps. You should always follow these steps in order and you should also never go backwards, which means if something is done for you, go forward, don't go backwards. And I say that because I've seen people who already have things in moles and decide, let me unconvert them from moles and just to reconvert them back into moles for some weird reason to go backwards. So if something's done for you, just be happy and go forward, never go backwards. But you definitely want to follow these steps and it should really lead you to the correct answer at the end here and we will see these four steps in action here in just a second so let's take a look at an equation such as this and i'm going to talk about all the relationships that you could get from this equation that you could use for stoichiometry so remember again that the stoichiometry all begins with a balanced equation which this guy is balanced so when we look for relationships in this equation, we always want to look at the coefficients. So when we look at these coefficients, we could first say that for every two moles of CO that I put in there, how many moles of O2 do I need? One. That's what that no number means, right? One mole of O2. And again, it is simply just those coefficients. Also, if I throw in there two moles of CO, I should get out how many moles of CO2? Two. And if I throw in there one mole of O2, I should get out how many moles of CO2? Two. Yeah. These are what are referred to as being stoichiometrically, that's a big word, stoichiometrically equal to each other. They are not, again, equal to each other in the sense of two equals one. It obviously doesn't. They are equal to each other in the sense of my cookie de analogy there. The proportions of each of these that you need to throw in there to get out the products. So these are the relationships that they get from the equation. Now, because these are still considered sort of equalities, just like in conversions, we could write conversion factors for each of these. So from this one equation... We can now write, for example, here that two moles of CO over one mole of O2, or we could flip it around one mole of O2 gives us two moles of CO. For our second one here, we could write two moles of CO over two moles of CO2, or we could flip our conversion factor around two moles of CO2 
two moles of CO. And for our last one here, one mole of O2 over two moles of CO2 are two moles of CO2 over one mole of O2. So from this one little equation here, we have what are referred to as three equalities that we could get. And we could get a grand total of six conversion factors that we could use in a problem. Will we use every conversion factor? No, you're just gonna use one, basically, the one that you need. So you're going to use one that you need uh, to get you to what you are looking for. So why do we need conversion factors like this? The reason we need conversion factors like this is you will have a problem where they will say, and let me just say it for you right now and just say it and do it here. Let's just say that you produced, now yeah, we'll go with the classic 45 grams of CO2. And we wanna know how many grams of O2 did we start with? So in this particular problem, we are have information about this guy, right? But we're really interested in the end, this guy. And there is no table where you can look up of uh, what is the relationship between CO2 and O2. And this is really what stoichiometry is, is nothing more than a conversion factor. And instead of looking up your conversion factor in a table, where you get your conversion factor from is actually the balanced equation. So we use the balanced equation as really like a conversion factor to allow us to go from CO2, which is the only piece of information we have in my example, to actually O2, which is really what we're interested in. So that is really what stoichiometry is. Sometimes people get really freaked out about the big word stoichiometry and what's going on, but it really is nothing more than just a conversion factor and the difference is where you get that conversion factor is actually the balance equation rather than looking it up. So since we have a little problem here, let's see how we do those four steps and how they all kind of work together. So the very first step that we want to do whenever we're doing a stoichiometry problem is to make sure our equation is balanced, which I'm going to really hope it is in this case. So it is in this case. So that is step number one. Step number two is to take whatever they gave us and we want to convert it to moles. Now, the only piece of information they gave us that has a number is what? 45 grams of CO2. So do I need to convert that to moles? I do. So how do I go from grams to moles? I need the... I need the molar mass of CO2 in this case, right? So we're going to go to the periodic table. We're going to look up for CO2, the molar mass, which means I have 12.01 for my carbon, right? And 2 times 16 for my oxygens. And dare I say that is a 4401 grams per mole, maybe. Somebody with a calculator double check because I didn't punch anything. I'm going to hope for the best there. <laughs> So that is really the sort of second step that we want. We only have one piece of information here. So we're going to take 45 grams of CO2. We're going to use the molar mass as our conversion factor, which means grams need to go on the bottom so that they cancel. Moles will go up on top. The grams will cancel. And if we get an answer here, that's going to be uh, 45 divided by 4401. That will give me 1.022. I'm gonna take it to a few digits because I'm not finished with my calculation yet of CO2. First off, any questions on that calculation? Pretty much the same calculation we just did earlier today, right? Taking our grams to moles, using the molar mass from the periodic table to do so. The reason again that we need to do this is because the third step, which is the stoichiometry step, is a mole-to-mole -mole relationship, which means in order for the units to cancel out correctly, you got to get your number into moles, which is why we did that first step. So now we're ready to do the big stoichiometry problem here. And the big stoichiometry part of this calculation is we want to go to the equation. 
We want to find our mole to mole relationship. So how do we know which relationship we're looking for? It's pretty simple to figure out. One relationship that we're looking for is what they gave us, which in this case is CO2, right? The other thing that we're looking for is what we're trying to find, which is O2. And we did that earlier. That is this relationship right here, right? And from that relationship that we got from the coefficients from the equation, it gave us an option of two conversion factors to use, right? So we want to pick the right conversion factors. So all we have to do is our normal sort of process here. We'll take our number there that we just had, which is 1.0225 moles of CO2. I want to get rid of CO2, right? And end up at O2. Do I use the conversion factor on the left or right? I do use the conversion factor on the left, opposites, right? And that is the big stoichiometry move right there, that little thing right there. That is two moles of CO2 that we got from the balanced equation. And we also have one mole of O2. And that is really the purpose of stoichiometry is they gave you information about somebody you don't really care about. You need to get some to somebody you do care about and you're going to use the equation basically to do that. That's going to get rid of the CO2, which we're no longer interested in, and now leave us with O2, which we are interested in. And I'm going to divide that by two, and that will give me 0 0.5112 moles of O2. Any questions on that so far? That is the third and big stoichiometry move right there. If I wanted moles, right, I would clean up the significant figures and put a box on it, right? And I would be done with the calculation. But do I want moles in this case? I don't. I actually want grams of O2. So I have one more step to do, which is step number four. And I'm going to do it up here since I'm running out of a little bit of room. I'm going to maybe uh, just get rid of this one that we didn't use here. We'll go up here. So step number four in the stoichiometry problems is to take the moles. And once again, when you get to step number four, you should always be in units of moles. As you can see here, we are in units of moles, which is good. And you want to convert it to some other unit. In this case, we are looking for grams, which once again means we need the molar mass of what now? Yeah, O2. We're no longer at CO2, so we should not use that molar mass anymore. We need the molar mass of O2. Uh, and the molar mass of O2 there is about 32 grams per mole, which is 16 times 2, basically, 32 grams per mole. So we'll do our final step here, which is 0 0.5112 moles of O2. We're going to use our molar mass and go opposites here, 32 grams per mole of O2. Moles of O2 will cancel, and we'll times that by a 32 in this case. And that's going to give me something like a 16.4 grams of O2 in this particular case. Those are the four steps to pretty much all your psychology problems. Just do those four steps in those order, and you will get to the end. Again, balance the equation. Take whatever they give you. Whatever unit it may be, by the way, it could be a weird units like pounds. You might have to go from pounds to grams, right? Or some other unit. But however many conversions you need to do, you need to take whatever they gave you to grams so that you could use the molar mass to go to moles. And once you do that, then you could do the stoichiometry, which is the third step using the mole to mole relationship. And lastly, a lot of times you do have to do that fourth step to take it from moles to some other unit. Again, here we might have wanted pounds, so you might have to do maybe another conversion as well. So it does depend on the problem, but uh, molar mass up front, molar mass on the back end is very common that she has to kind of use it in these type of calculations. What does this number mean? This number means that if you produced in this case, right, 45 grams of CO2, since it's a product, that was what was produced. In order to produce that 45 grams of CO2, you would have to throw in there 16.4 grams of O2 and everything would have to go perfect, which it never does in real life, but everything went perfect in real life, you would have produced uh, 45 grams of CO2. Question on those steps, yeah. Uh, just for clarification. Yeah. So we wanna make sure that it's, the equation is balanced, right? 
first, and then that's where we get our. Absolutely. So, like, none of this works correctly if the equation is not balanced because that is where you're going for your conversions, right? So, if you don't have the right coefficients up there, the rest of your calculation is going to be off because you have the wrong sort of uh, mold to mold relationships. So, that is like always the first thing that you want to do is. And sometimes people overlook that step because sometimes they are given the equation, but sometimes it's not balanced even if you're given the equation. So I would strongly look at the equation. If you see an equation, there's no coefficients. I would take a really hard look at it to make sure that it is balanced. And if it's not balanced, I would make sure you balance it obviously before you do it. I would say you're probably safe if you're given an equation, you see some numbers there. Unless somebody's trying to trick you, usually they don't. But if you see numbers there, it's probably a safe bet that it's probably balanced. But it's still a good idea just to double check. Nobody's trying to do anything weird with you. Um, but uh, I would say if you see numbers, probably going to be balanced. But definitely if you don't see numbers, you should take a look at it. But yeah, all of this is basically contingent on that equation being balanced because that is where we get these stoichiometry relationships. And if it is not balanced and you have the wrong relationships, which means ultimately your calculation is going to be wrong in the end. So that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. We got this, this is how we're going to have a written form and it also got like uh, covering on side and then the oxygen and gulp is carbon dioxide. I should understand by myself that when I put the oxygen, I should put, put it as a molecule, not as an atom. Like, I should you, put an O2. You, you should. That's a really good question. And it's sometimes what people also, just in general, with these type of problems or just uh, equation type problems, if you're asked to write an equation that's in words, remember that we do have those diatomic molecules, which are elements. And if you have like hydrogen, nitrogen, you know, oxygen, you do need to do it as O2, H2, N2. Uh, sometimes these things are also in terms of words referred to as being a, a molecular oxygen or molecular hydrogen. And that means that basically it's, it is the diatomic molecule. So you want to make sure you do that. You don't want to do it. A lot of people will do that. They'll write something like this if they have in words like CO plus O goes to the other side, or if they have something like hydrogen, they're right, you know, plus H. And you won't probably get it to balance right, or maybe you will or won't, but you definitely, if it's a diatomic element by itself, that's a molecule, um, you want to make sure you have that too in there so that balances correctly. Other questions? One last thing here before everybody runs out, just relax. Again, quite fast that clock, about five minutes or so fast, relax. When we talk about uh, stoichiometry, uh, sometimes people also always think that you have to go across the arrow in terms of the relationship. And you can go across the arrow and do a stoichiometry problem, but you could also do a stoichiometry problem on the same side of the arrow. So if you have two reactants like we have here, we could do some stoichiometry relationships between those two. If you actually had two products or more products, you could actually do it on the right-hand side of the arrow. So some people always think you got to kind of go across the arrow to do these type of problems, and you don't. You can do it from one side of the arrow to the other, like we did in this problem. You could do it between two reactants, still the same four steps. You could do it between two products, still the same four steps. So you can do stoichiometry with anybody in the equation, and that's why it's a really good calculation because really all you need to know is one thing that's going on in that equation, how many grams of one person, and you can basically figure out how much of everybody else that you would need in that equation to have it basically work correctly. So I keep that in mind. Again, sometimes people always think you kind of have to go across the arrow. Any questions?